Hi, I'm Dr. Joel Pileski from the University of California, San Francisco, and I am absolutely delighted to be joining you today for the Patient Summit of the Anal Cancer Foundation, an organization that is very near and dear to my heart. I'm going to be talking about anal cancer prevention today, a good news story, as you'll see in a very short while. By way of disclosures, uh, I've done some work with some companies that work on new HPV therapeutics. You'll find out soon why that's important, as well as some work with the HPV vaccine and some new ways to diagnose HPV. So in my short time with you today, I'm going to be talking about the current state of research for anal cancer prevention and describe to you some of those results that I think give great hope for reducing future incidents of anal cancer. As you know, anal cancer is a rare disease in the general population, but has been increasing in incidence, as shown on this slide with graphs showing rising incidence of anal cancer, both, both women and with men. Now, having said that the incidence of anal cancer is rare in the general population, we know that there are certain risk groups that are at especially high risk of anal cancer. They are shown on this slide where the higher you are on this graph and the redder the number, the higher the risk of anal cancer. There are in fact five groups at especially high risk of anal cancer. The general population is shown here at the bottom in green and teal, but the groups at very high risk include three groups living with HIV, men who have sex with men, men living with HIV who do not have sex with men, and then women living with HIV. In addition, women who have HPV related cancers at other genital sites such as the vulva, and the cervix are at increased risk, and people who are immunosuppressed for reasons other than HIV, shown here, for example, people who have received uh, a graft of a new organ, such as a kidney transplant, who are then given medicine to immunosuppress them to prevent rejection of that graft, are at increased risk of anal cancer. These groups tend to be at increased risk over time, either as a function of years after the transplant or age, as shown with these groups living with HIV. When we talk about prevention of anal cancer, there's really two categories. The first is primary prevention, which basically means preventing acquisition of the agent that causes the cancer. Like cervical cancer, anal cancer is caused by HPV, human papillomavirus. We now have a great vaccine for prevention of acquisition of HPV, and this acquisition can be prevented using vaccination before ideally people become sexually active, but can be given up to age 27 or under some circumstances up to age 45. But the best way to reduce anal cancer is when the vaccine is given to people who have not had much sexual exposure, ideally at ages 11 to 12 before initiation of sexual activity. In fact, we've shown that HPV vaccination very effectively reduces acquisition of both anal HPV and the anal cancer precursor caused by HPV, which we'll talk about in a bit, high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesions, or HSIL for short. So we talked about primary prevention, and then the second approach is secondary prevention. And this is for people who, for whatever reason, did not receive the HPV vaccine in time. They're either too old, the vaccine wasn't available then, or they were of the correct age, but for whatever reason, did not have access to the HPV vaccine. So for these folks, we can't prevent HPV infection, but what we can do is prevent progression of a high-grade lesion that may have developed as a result of that HPV infection, pre preventing it from progressing to cancer by removing it before that progression event occurs. This is, in fact, what we do for cervical cancer prevention. When women are having cervical pap smears, we're trying to find these cervical high-grade lesions so that we can identify them using a special technique called colposcopy and remove that lesion before it progresses to cancer. So that's shown on this slide. Cervical cancer and anal cancer are very similar diseases. They're both preceded by these high-grade lesions. This is what these high-grade lesions look like here on the right side of uh, the graph where normal skin of the cervix is shown here. Again, anus and cervix are very similar. So if a woman has an abnormal cervical pap smear and she has this colposcopy procedure to identify the high-grade lesion, once it's biopsy proven, then the clinician will remove this lesion 
to prevent progression to cancer, which happens when these cells cross the bottom of the skin into the tissues down below. So again, just to summarize, the model of anal cancer prevention relies on two different approaches. One is primary prevention, that's ideal, but for people who did not receive HPV vaccination, secondary prevention is the next best hope to prevent anal cancer. And unfortunately, since the vaccine has only been available for a little more than 11, 12 years, particularly in men, a little longer in women, secondary prevention is the basically the only way to prevent uh, cancer progression in people who have already acquired HPV, which is many, many people. The other thing I just want to mention is that there's a difference between screening for anal age cell, the cancer precursor, and cancer itself. These use different techniques. For example, we already talked about HRA to detect anal age cell, the precancer, but if we want to find cancer itself, it's very important to use a very different technique, which is actually insertion of the provider's finger into the anal canal. We call that digital anorectal exams. And this is primarily to find hard lumps that may indicate the presence of a cancer that is already there. It is a good idea to find these as soon as possible because the survival rates for anal cancer are better the earlier you find those cancers. So since I've told you that anal and cervical cancer are so similar, and we know that treatment of cervical H cell does reduce the incidence of cervical cancer, you may be wondering why haven't we been just doing the same thing all along, at least for people at high risk, um, in the anus. And the answer is that until recently, we did not have the evidence that it actually worked. Not because it doesn't work, but because nobody did the study. It's a very big and challenging study to do, but we've done it. And the idea was to provide that evidence. And once we have that evidence, we have the expectation that it will become a standard of care procedure to do this in, at least in the groups at risk. So to do the study, uh, we got some support from the National Cancer Institute, also supported many very important community organizations, such as the Anal Cancer Foundation, which really played a key role in convincing the government to support this study. It's called the ANCHOR study, the Anal Cancer HCL Outcomes Research Study. And basically the goal was to identify people who are at high risk of HCL and see if treating HCL actually reduce the incidence of anal cancer. The only way to show that it's the treatment that worked is to have a comparison group, namely people who had HCL who were followed without treatment for comparison. We call that a randomized controlled trial. You've seen this slide already, but you can see that it's the groups with HIV who are at amongst the highest risk. And so we decided to do the study in this group of people because of their high risk and because we'd be able to study a relatively small number of people to answer our study question. So the organization of the study is shown here. We screened people living with HIV who are over the age of 35 for anal age cell. And if we found it and they met the other study criteria, they were randomized 50-50 to active monitoring where we followed the high grade without treatment or we treated them as well as we could. And then we counted up the number of cases of cancer over time in both of these arms. Well, the results of this uh, landmark study were published a few months ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. Citation is shown here. And we found many important things, but I'm gonna just highlight two sets of important findings. The first is that to find the number of people who we needed to enroll in the study, and that was actually 4,446 people we had to screen about 10,700 people uh, over a period of time. But what we found in that screening population, which is more or less representative of the community of people living with HIV in the US right now, that 53% of the men already had anal age cell, 47% of the women, and 67% of transgender individuals had anal age cell. That's a lot of anal age cell. We also found 17 people who had cancer without knowing it. We found it thanks to their having come into the uh, anchor study for screening. And of course, these individuals were not enrolled in the study, but were instead immediately referred for treatment. So we're glad they came in. Uh, none of them were symptomatic. And that rate was very high at 160 per 100,000 overall. 
But as far as the results of the anchor study were concerned, amongst those people who we randomized and followed, amongst the people who were treated, we used a relatively simple office-based uh, therapy called electrocautery. And the important finding was that in the treated group, there was a 57% reduction in anal cancer, which was statistically significant. This was a very big deal. First time ever that a randomized control trial has shown that treating anal age cell does work. The other point you'll note though, it's not a perfect reduction in anal cancer. We would have loved 100%. So what it's saying is that using this technique, which is more or less the best one we have right now, it works, but we still have room for improvement. Moreover, and importantly, these treatment procedures were safe and well tolerated. So what are the implications of the ANCHOR study? Again, treatment of anal HL is effective in reducing the incidence of anal cancer, a very important step forward in anal cancer prevention combined with HPV vaccination of people who are eligible for vaccination. And these data are were so compelling that the guidelines have been rewritten for the care of people living with HIV, because that's the group we did the study in, and are being reviewed now by the Centers for Disease Control. We hope to have guidelines in place soon that actually institute screening for and treating anal age cell as standard of care. I mentioned that there's room for improvement in treatment, and we also need tests that tell us who amongst all the very many people with anal age cell are most likely to progress, a biomarker for progression to cancer, so that we can focus our resources and our somewhat still limited uh, diagnostic uh, uh, resources on those individuals most likely to progress. So we need to optimize the way we screen because the number of people who know how to do HRA is still quite limited in the United States. And we need to make sure that only the right people or those at highest risk of cancer get referred for HRA. But we also need to increase the pool of people who know how to do HRA. So we need a large scale up of HRA training programs. Very importantly for this group also is we need to figure out what do these results that we got in people living with HIV mean for people who don't have HIV? How can we extrapolate these results to other groups? Should the screening for and treating anal age cell be standard of care in these other groups? So again, I'm coming back to the slide I've now shown you twice before to again remind you that the highest risk groups are the people living with HIV. Um, but despite the fact that these are the highest risk groups, they don't actually contribute most of the cases of anal cancer that are detected on an annual basis. We have the high risk groups and low risk groups. The high risk group, for example, is one where we have a lot of cases on a per, say, 100 person basis, but the size of that population is relatively small overall. The number of people in the group is small. Low risk groups, such as the general population, they may be at lower risk of anal cancer, but the total number of people in that group is relatively large. So let me illustrate this with a theoretical example. It turns out that most of the cases of anal cancer actually come from low risk groups, not the people with HIV or women with uh, other HPV related diseases or even other immunosuppressed people. It comes from people who are otherwise at low risk in the general population, and here's why. Supposing you have a high-risk group, such as people with HIV, say 10% say of them have a disease, but they're only a small proportion of the population. Say there's only 1,000 such individuals. So if 10% had that disease, that would contribute 100 cases. Ta say, on the other hand, you have a low-risk group where only 1% have that disease, but there are a lot more of such people, say a million people who are at low risk. If only 1% have them, that still contributes 10,000 cases. So you can see how even low risk groups will contribute more cases if the size of that at risk population is larger. That is in fact what's happening with anal cancer. We know who the highest risk groups are, but in fact, those risk groups together only contribute a relatively small proportion of the total burden of cases in terms of absolute numbers. So the challenge that we have, in addition to figuring out whether we can extrapolate our data from anchor to the other high-risk groups, besides those with HIV, is how can we efficiently identify those in the low-risk group 
who are at risk of anal cancer. So we're past this fork in the road now. I think we now know that we can prevent anal cancer with secondary prevention, and we need to do a lot more with screening, treatment, and training. So I often get asked, what can I do now? So first I wanna emphasize that regardless of your risk group, if you have any uh, symptoms or signs listed here, you should be asked for referral for early cancer screening, such as unexplained anal bleeding, a feeling of fullness, itching, pain, or other symptoms, change in uh, bowel frequency, a new growth, new discharge, or any lumps in the groin. I encourage you to reach out with your questions to the International Anal Neoplasia Society, UCSF, which is where I work. We have a, a website um, that has a lot of information for patients and, of course, the Anal Cancer Foundation. Other things that really should happen now is make sure that everybody who is eligible for HPV vaccination does receive the vaccine. We think that everybody, at least people living with HIV and probably the other at-risk, high-risk groups, should get an annual digital anal rectal exam. I mentioned that we're going to be having standard of care guidelines soon, at least for people living with HIV. And the other thing that I want to mention is there is limited HRA capacity right now. And until that um, set of resources is available, I think individuals who are concerned should at a minimum get an annual DARE and everybody should work to make sure that they have the resources put into place over time to do everything that is needed. But until then, screening should only be done uh, when that set of resources is in place. In the intermediate and long-term, you and us and all the groups who have an interest in this disease should continue to work together to advocate for expansion of HRA training programs and advocate for research on new HCL treatments. We also need to advocate for extension of standard of care guidelines from the anchor study, at least to the other risk groups on the graphs that I've been showing you. And we need to figure out how to best approach the low risk populations to uh, figure out the most efficient way to identify those at risk of anal cancer. So I'm gonna stop here, but not without expressing my deepest gratitude to the many people who contributed to helping us get the data that I've just presented to you, the anchor investigators and study staffs at the 25 sites around the country that did the study, our study participants, most of all, our community advisory board and our friends in the community, such as the Anal Cancer Foundation, the AIDS Malignancy Consortium of the National Cancer Institute, which uh, funded the study, and Emma's Corporation, which helped us administer the study. Thank you very much for your attention. Mm -hmm.